If you're watching this video on YouTube, then you're one of the billions of social network users around the world who have each logged at least hundreds if not thousands of hours across various social apps over the years. Whether it's through Instagram, Snapchat, Reddit, Discord, TikTok, or really any other app with a social hook, you've probably developed this intuitive understanding of knowing what type of people and content you'll run into in each app and what role they each fit in your day-to-day -day life. In fact, we all seem to have this unconscious fluency in the cultural and operational differences between these products. This video is an attempt to articulate the forces behind why all of these different social networks are the way they are. Why does TikTok serve you videos from random people, while Facebook tends to be more personal with content from family and friends? Why might someone be an active chatter on Discord, but a complete lurker on Reddit? Why do you use some social apps for connecting with family and friends, and others for connecting with strangers? We'll try to answer these types of questions by proposing a framework for what the foundational characteristics of a social network are. I consider these to be how users are connected, how communities are formed, what type of creators drive content on the platform, and lastly, what type of core action users take. A few quick notes before we get into it. One is that I'm using the term social network broadly here to apply to lots of products that have any sort of meaningful social feature. Products like Facebook or Snapchat are very clear cut social network examples, while on the other hand, products like YouTube and Reddit might not be thought of first and foremost as social products, but for the purposes of this video, I'm including all these products so long as they have any meaningful social component in them. The second thing I want to mention is that this is a heavily product managerial perspective on social networks. My purview is very narrow, and I'm leaving out a lot of technical aspects, UI, UX design elements, and business considerations. This is not meant to be an exhaustive list of everything, rather just some limited ideas based on my experience working on consumer social products. Which brings me to my last disclaimer. This could all be totally wrong, and my ideas probably aren't wholly original either. I'm sure someone else online has articulated something similar already, but in a much more coherent or elegant manner. But nonetheless, these are thoughts that I've been formulating through experimentation and through marketing and product managing these types of products firsthand. So if you have any feedback along the way, I'd love to hear it. With that, let's get into it. The framework I'm proposing is that social networks can be defined by some combined weight of four interconnected attributes. These attributes are connections, community, creators, and core actions. Yes, I did play with the terms to make them all begin with C. But each attribute has some range of weights that's best defined as two opposing extremes. Most social networks, especially in their early stages, will skew towards one of these extremes. And as we'll see shortly with some examples, each attribute influences the next one, and there are complementary patterns and sets of these attributes that tend to work better than others. And at the end of the day, that is what gives a social network its identity and its overall feel. The first attribute to look at is a connections. This describes how people in the network are related and who they interact with. The weights for this attribute are local connections and global connections. Local means close connections, typically first or second degree connections, like your friends, family, immediate network. Think back to when you first signed up for Facebook and the types of people you were connecting with. The fact that your connections were called friends of the app is a clear tell of the type of network they were trying to build, one that was hyper-personalized and locally mappable. On the other hand, a social network can also connect users globally. Global connections basically encompass people you may or may not know personally, and it could be third, fourth, fifth degree connections and beyond. And an example of this type of connection is when you follow a celebrity on Instagram or see a TikTok video from a random person halfway around the world. You don't know them, you're not DMing them, but nonetheless, by you following them or engaging with their content, the network has facilitated a global connection. It should be noted that like all of these attributes we'll look at, it's more of a sliding scale than a one or a zero. In practice, every social network connects users locally and globally to some degree. But again, what we're looking at is the predominant force and predominant identity, especially early on in a social app's life. The intentionality behind who a network is connecting is super critical because this is where a lot of product dynamics cascade from. Everything from whether users use a real name or a pseudonymous name, whether they primarily create content or just consume content, whether profiles are default public or private, and whether an app asks you for your phone contacts permission, or whether users share content on platform or off platform, all these things can be traced back to who they are connected to to begin with. The next attribute is community. This is how users are grouped or defined on the social network, either implicitly or explicitly. Explicit means that there is a user-facing label or opt-in mechanic that explicitly identifies a user's membership in a community. Implicit would be the opposite, where someone's community is implied without clear or public boundaries enforced by a platform. Rather, implicit communities tend to be enforced passively through content algorithms. I find community in general to be a somewhat passive attribute that doesn't always have a clear correlation with whether the social network is a locally or globally connected one. But what matters is that there is an intentional design towards some community, period. 
In order for a social app to find its niche in a user's daily habits and have some coherent use case, it needs to put the user in some community or communities that deliver meaningful or targeted content, as well as some feeling of belonging, whether or not it's conscious to the user that they're in a community. At the minimum, the user experience is just better when they feel like they're in one. An example of implicit community would be Twitter or TikTok. Your sense of community there might not be conscious, but it is dictated by the content algorithms that serve you your interests rather than by your explicit membership in some group. These platforms have a mapping of your interests and habits on their back end based on your behaviors, but it's not readily visible to you. If I'm really into basketball and I always engage with basketball content, then Twitter and TikTok are going to identify that interest through the patterns in my data and my usage, and then reinforce that by showing me more basketball content and making me feel like that is my community on their platform, despite me never having to, to subscribe to a specific creator or join any group. Of course, there is some gray area, right, where Twitter does have groups and lists and TikToks as hashtags, which can kind of serve as this soft community label. The other end of the spectrum, though, is explicit community. These are membership-based communities, usually via some explicit opt-in mechanic. There's a clear line on who is in the community and who is not. Discord and Reddit would be some examples. To use Discord, you have to explicitly join servers, and everyone in the server can see who is a member through discrete membership status. Reddit, with their subreddit system, operates kind of the same way. Users will curate their own personally picked subreddits that they're a part of, and that is what Reddit uses to compose people's content feeds. You may notice with these examples that the number one determinant of community type is actually data, namely what the social network knows about you and how they use that data to alter your experience, usually through a For You feed algorithm. Reddit and Discord don't know much about their users and are not nearly as good as Facebook or TikTok at inferring interests. Therefore, you can bet that most social apps that rely on explicit communities typically are the ones that don't collect much personal information in the first place, oftentimes at the detriment to their own ability to monetize. Of course, how social networks monetize can be a big topic for another video. Moving on though, the next attribute is creators. Actually, this might be better framed as content because what we're trying to identify is the type of user who creates the majority of content on the platform, which in turn determines whether the content you see on a social network is short tail or long tail content. The opposing weights for this are short tail creators versus long tail creators, referring to where users fall on a distribution of content creation and engagement. Long tail users refer to the majority of users on a network. These tend to be random users like you and I. We're just small fish who really just view content, maybe write some tweets here and there, post weekly Instagram photos for our friends to see, or maybe upload the occasional YouTube video to our few subscribers. This content tends to not get much overall engagement at all because it's for a very limited audience. And these creators might not even identify as creators. But if you amass a large number of these users, you start to have some meaningful amount of content in aggregate. Hence, this is what we call the long tail. Short tail creators are the more professional or serious content creators like your Mr. Beasts and PewDiePies on YouTube, Elon Musk on Twitter, or some Instagram influencer with hundreds of thousands of followers. These users make up a small percentage of the whole user base, but drive a disproportionately large percentage of the content. So why does it matter what type of creator is driving the content on a social network? Well, as new social networks emerge, they almost always skew towards one type of creator, and it should not be by accident. It should be by design, because this is directly correlating back to how the network is connected. Locally connected social networks tend to rely on long tail creators for content, and globally connected ones tend to rely on short tail creators. Think back to your early Facebook or Discord usage. When you're connected with first and second degree connections, your content experience becomes more personal and the median user feels more empowered to create content because they know who their close audience is. The personalized context setting and local, often private distribution of content creates the ripe conditions for an average Joe or Jane to feel comfortable posting content. On a more globally connected app though, like TikTok or YouTube, most users don't post at all, and the vast majority of views are collected by a small minority of professional short tail creators. Over time, most social networks will exhibit both qualities. Platforms that start long tail dominant eventually see short tail creators start to break out. Take YouTube, for example. What started off as a video hosting website eventually developed into a content powerhouse with tons of original creators developing huge followings. Moving on, the last attribute is core action. This is the primary activity that the majority of users perform on the platform, with consumption on one end and creation on the other. Social apps will often either be primarily consumption dominant or have a dual creation and consumption loop. This really goes hand in hand with the type of creator on the platform that we just talked about. Here's some examples. I would call YouTube and TikTok's core action to be consumption. Yes, everyone can create, but the predominant behavior for the median user is consumption. Discord, Snapchat, and most messaging-oriented apps, on the other hand, I would consider these to be dual creation and consumption networks. 
Most users will create, which in this case means send messages. And of course, if they are sending messages, then they are reading messages, which is why consumption generally follows right along. The reason this attribute is important is because oftentimes new social apps might launch with an assumption that most users are going to behave a certain way or that certain types of creators will flock to the platform without ever examining the rest of the equation that will lead to this behavior. To drive this framework home, let's make up a hypothetical example. Say I'm creating a social app for people who like to go to concerts. My thesis is concert going is a growing industry where users could benefit from finding friends to go to concerts with and sharing their concert experiences on a sort of Instagram-like app. And eventually I want to monetize it with, say, ads or building a ticket selling layer. My hope, hypothetically, is that users build the habit of posting to this app anytime they go to a concert so that there's this lively ecosystem of concert discussion amongst friends. How do I then design this network? Without a clear mapping of how users connect and who is creating content, you could have a contradictory social network or contradictory business goals set up for failure. Working backwards now from the attributes we just discussed, if the intended behavior is that most users would become posters, then we are going for a long tail driven creator slash content economy, most likely bounded by explicit communities with each node or user on the social network connected locally. I think that would create the right conditions for that type of behavior. Why? As we discussed earlier, local connections mean that you can onboard to this app with friends. Concert going seems like a social activity you participate in with first degree connections, so that is the most valuable node to connect users with. From there, maybe explicit communities start to form around genre, geographic, venue, or performer-specific interests. And ideally, that serves as a scaffolding for the average long-tail user to feel comfortable posting all their concert activity, linking their Spotify accounts, and tagging their friends to keep the flywheel of this social app going. That's not to say that any other permutation of weights on these attributes couldn't work, but there would definitely have to be some clear rationale for it. What if some marketing person proposed that, say as a launch strategy, my company should partner up with as many A-list performers and bands as possible, because that would build the social proof and attract the performers' audiences. Within the framework we've outlined, this could be rationalized positively or negatively. The strategy could be the wrong focus if the intention is that we want users to connect with friends and develop a habit of content creation. It might seem counterintuitive, but the reason is because when the emphasis on the app is placed on connecting users globally, in this case connecting users to performers directly, the content on the platform will skew towards being driven by short tail creators like those bands and A-list performers. Think of the prototypical TikTok or Instagram Reels content experience where you're not going to see much content from your friends nearly as much as you're going to see content from strangers. This type of core loop quickly becomes a consumptive loop that does not encourage the median user to post. On the other hand, you could rationalize an A-list partnership strategy if you alter the product to focus on global connection as a whole and perhaps have a global for you feed. Maybe in this version of the product, more resources are allocated to seeding enough content and interests and onboarding as many professional creators as possible. I guess my point is not that there's a right or wrong answer here, but rather a framework-based approach can give a team a path to asking and answering the right questions. Anyways, we could go through a lot more examples, but I think those are the four key attributes at play. To recap, we have connections, how users connect and engage with others, community, which is how user groups are delineated, creators, either short tail or long tail, and lastly, core action, either consumption or creation or both. You can map social networks to a range on these four attributes, and the combination of those weights will tell you a lot about how the network operates and what type of behavior you can extrapolate from users. Successful social networks demonstrate attributes that are complementary and not pulling in opposite directions. All right, so this video might be getting long in the tooth at this point, and I have to say, in preparing some notes for this video, I wanted to scrap the whole thing multiple times because honestly, this framework, if you can call it that, could be interpreted and rebuilt in so many different ways. And my intention is not to sound like a authority figure on social networks, rather, this is just some insight from my experience working on consumer social products. So hopefully there's something useful in here. Maybe in the future, I'll make a part two. And if you have any thoughts, challenges to the ideas presented, or anything in between, feel free to share them. Thanks for watching.